Hello, my name is Maggie Kusman. I am a knitter and sewer who lives in Denver, Colorado. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a strange episode because um, shortly after I filmed my last episode, I uh, was frantically knitting on my Soldatna crop uh, and it became pretty evident that I was going to finish it pretty quickly. So I actually filmed a little... Uh, work in progress video and life update while I was knitting that um, in a hotel room in Chicago. Um, I knit or I filmed that video actually right before I took my last test of medical school, which is crazy. Um, the step to clinical skills exam. And so I will insert the video here so that you can watch that. And then I'll talk a little bit more about my general what am I working on and what have I finished recently. Hello! Um, so right now I am in a hotel room in Chicago, Illinois because tomorrow morning I am taking my last board exam and actually last exam of medical school which is crazy. Um, I spent a lot of time last night just sort of thinking with my husband Sean about the adventure that I have been on and the fact that tomorrow is really the last big hurdle. Um, the last big hurdle that I have and then after that I'll really be, you know, well on my way to becoming a doctor and um, actually getting to spend time with patients um, and do what I love every day. Um, and that feels really <laughs> exciting but also a little bit terrifying um, just because any test is really stressful and um, this test shouldn't be too bad um, just because it's like talking with patients well fake patients they're like actors but talking with them as if they're real patients and sort of doing physical exams and stuff like that um, but it is eight hours long <laughs> which is you know it's like an average work day, but it's just hard when you're constantly being watched and uh, judged by the person that you're working with, but also by, you know, a bunch of um, people behind a glass that are kind of watching how you do and how you talk to patients, I guess. In some ways, though, now that I'm thinking about it, I do feel like it is... I don't care about the judgment of these people as much as I care about how my patients actually feel when I'm in the room and they're sort of telling me their life story and what makes them scared and what makes them excited and you know I think one of the most beautiful things about medicine is that we really get to be there for people through the changes in their lives and we get to be a confidant and an advocate and someone that people can trust and that they can turn to when they're really scared. Um, but anyway, um, I got up this morning at like <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning um, and flew to Chicago and then took a couple trains to get to the hotel room and now I'm just sort of relaxing. I had all of these high hopes of sort of going into Chicago and exploring a little bit just because I haven't spent a, ton a bunch of time in this city. Um, but truthfully, I'm exhausted and I'm really looking forward to just relaxing. Um, I really want to just relax, <laughs> just relax, um, and do some stress knitting. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I, am, this is only being filmed like two days after I filmed the last podcast, which is pretty crazy, um, just because of how much progress I have made on one particular project. And I actually wanted to film this because I think that in a couple of weeks when I film next time, um, I will be probably finished with this and hopefully wearing it because I, as I've been knitting it, I've just been like falling more and more and more in love with it. It's just incredible. I'm drinking some coffee, um, which I should probably stop drinking at some point because it's like 1230, but it tastes good. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is the Soldatna crop. Um, this is knit with bull and vine yarns um, in the in her DK colorway, which is an 801010 merino cashmere nylon base. And 
it is so incredible. <laughs> like, honestly, I'm a little bit worried about how it will hold up just because it is like the softest yarn that I have ever felt and also the most beautiful thing I've ever made. Honestly, I love it so much. And I know that not a ton of creativity went into this because I literally just bought her colorways, but you know, if you see something that is incredible, you should just go for it, even if you didn't come up with it. <laughs> and copying is the finest form of flattery or something like that. Anyhow, um, so I might not be able to remember every name of the colors, but I will show this to you as a finished object in a couple of weeks. Um, but this sort of orange burnt orange color that has also like flecks of brown and gold um, and also some flecks of like red too every once in a while. This is Revenge of the Harpsichord. Um, oh, it's so good. Um, this sort of gray color that you see down here and also up here is uh, Grim. Um, this one right here, the sort of green color that you see throughout um, is Deadly Nightshades, and I also just finished a um, a Stephen West shawl that um, was knit half out of Deadly Nightshades, um, and I have to say, I think it might be like my favorite color ever. Like, I just, I mean, there's a reason why I've bought so much of it. I think it's like the perfect combination between a sort of earthy sage green like earthy turquoise slash sage green but then it also is just like dirty with all of these like specks of like black and brown and gold and red and I just it's so it's like lit literally perfect um and then the pink color is Cortesian I think um and I also really love that colorway it's sort of like a pale pink that then also has again it's like very dirty with specks of like bright pink and brown and um, gold and things like that and together I just really love how it's turning out. Um, the only things that I have changed from Kristen's uh, color choices is that um, and also from the pattern I followed it except for the this motif right here um, is supposed to be the brown color but I wanted to bring in more of this pink color and um, I thought that it would sort of tie it in together a little bit better. Um, so I put the pink in there and then these little, I don't know what these are called, but these little stitches that are just every so often, um, I'm using the Deadly Nightshades and the Revenge of the Harpsichord. So the brown and the green, which I think is also what Kristen did, but not, ne not the colors that the pattern calls for if you're like going exactly to what it says. Um, I'm quite tall. Um, I am 5'10". I'm hoping this will fit. I didn't swatch. I never swatch. It's like very, very rare that I swatch. And you know, it has come to bite me in the butt a couple of times because like this sweater that I have um, that I'm knitting for Bob, Sean's dad, I actually got all the way to like here on the sweater the first time I knit it so really far and I had to pull the whole thing out because it was like way too big um, which luckily Sean um, he's a little bit smaller than his dad but they're like almost the exact same size and so I could try it on him but I did have to pull out that entire thing and re-knit it um, so it's not to say that it doesn't like come to bite me in the ass and this is something that I wouldn't really be able to pull out and re-knit because um, because I'm breaking the yarn so often that it would just be a mess. Um, so it's gonna work. And I also am doing it a little bit, um, I'm not doing it with as much ease as Kaylin Hunter calls for in the pattern. So um, she calls for like four inches of positive ease or something like that. And I um, decided that I wanted it to be a little bit more form fitting um, because, I like the boxy cut, but I have a lot of things that are that cut, so I want to have a couple of different options. Um, so, so with this one, I'm doing it with, um, I'm following with the pattern with, like, it will be, uh, I think, like, half an inch 
larger than my bust size. Um, so I think that that will actually fit really well. Um, and generally, like I've knit a few of Caitlin Hunter's patterns before, and I'm always usually on, like exactly on or um, a little bit bigger than her. So I think I'm like almost the same. I use almost the same tension as Caitlin Hunter. So generally when I'm doing her patterns in particular, I don't feel like I need to swatch because I am pretty sure that they're going to be the same. However, I also recognize that <laughs> that changes with the yarn that you use. So, you know, this is really just something that I tell myself to make myself feel better, but obviously isn't true. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I think, you know, I like knitting, so if I have to pull it out every once in a while, it's fine. But this is not something I can do that with, so hopefully it'll be great. Um, I'm really liking this knit. I feel like everybody talks about how it's like a potato chip. I knit the entire yoke in like less than 36 hours. Um, and it was so good. I think the thing that I really like about it is that you do have to keep looking at the chart to like find out sort of what is coming next, but um, you never have to catch your floats. I think there's one time in which the in which they're six apart, and so some people might catch that, but I think it's fine. Um, and that's really nice. And then also like with this, you can read your read your knitting and you just sort of have to look how to set it up and then after that you kind of know where you're going to be going um, and it's also similar for like this chart down here if you just see what it looks like then you can kind of just follow your stitches and know where to go um, and so I found it to be like a very easy color work pattern for that reason um, and it's also just been really fun to see um, the woolen vine yarn like knit up and blend together. I like that mine is like very low contrast. Um, so there's more contrast when you're like seeing it in person, but um, I recognize that it's not as like contrasting as some of the others that I've seen, um, which I like. I think it's like a little bit more subtle. It, it really goes with like the fashion of the American West, you know, with the colors and Oh, it's just so perfect. I'm like, I'm obsessed with it. I literally can't put it down. Um, I'm going to be knitting it all afternoon just to like stress knit away my worries. Uh, but I'm really, really enjoying it. I think I'm going to be done with it very soon. Um, it's very, very, very fast. Um, after I finish my exam, I am also going to be going to visit my sister lives just outside of Chicago um, with her husband and her two kiddos. Um, so I'm going to be staying with them for a about five days. Um, and there's this really beautiful yarn store that's only a little while away, like maybe 15 minutes away from them by like in a car. Um, so I think I'm going to try to go to that yarn store, but other than that, I'm just going to be knitting and relaxing and spending time with my sister and my nieces and nephews and celebrating sort of one of the last big hurdles in med school, which is crazy. It's like both gone by very fast and very slow. <laughs> right now it feels like it is moving like at a glacial pace, just so slow um but I know that I'll look back and it will all feel like a blur so um I'm really excited for that but it's also like a little bit nerve-wracking but anyway um that's all it's just a short little thing I just wanted to show you the work on my soldatna and sort of chat about what's going on with me um before I transition before it's finished. I wanted to be able to show it as a um, work in progress, but um, yeah, it's great. I love it. Um, I am naming it the Bars of Azkaban Fortress, Soldatna, because I feel like it really reminds me of the um, rusted bars that I imagine to be um, what houses all of the people within um, the Azkaban Fortress, especially because Azkaban is kind of like this like crazy prison that's in the middle of the ocean. I just imagine that there's a lot of rust and things like that. And it just really reminds me of rust. Um, so I'll probably talk a little bit more about Azkaban and maybe Sirius Black um, 
on my next podcast. I think he's just like a beautifully complex character. Um, I think he's actually very similar to Snape in that you get glimpses of his positive nature, but also lots of glimpses of his really terrible self as well. Um, particularly in the way that he treats Snape actually throughout their time um, at Hogwarts. And I also just think he's complex because of the life that he lived. And yeah, I think about the fact that he is like, I did it, it's my fault, because he essentially, you know, convinced um, James and Lily to put their confidence in uh, Peter Pettigrew rather than in himself because he thought that it would be better, but then that's what ended up killing them. Um, so he just obviously feels very guilty about that, um, even though it's obviously not his fault that Peter Pettigrew betrayed them. But yeah, um, I'll probably, I mean, maybe I'll talk about Sirius. Maybe I'll also talk about some of the other people that are in Azkaban, like Bellatrix Lestrange. Um, and some of the other Death Eaters that are housed there. I mean, Hagrid also spends some time um, at Azkaban Fortress, particularly during the second book he's sent there, um, because they think that he's the one who has been attacking Muggleborns. Um, so, bars of Azkaban Fortress. I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about it. <laughs> um, and also just like doing a little bit of reading myself, so. Um, that is all I have. Um, I hope that everybody out there is enjoying this lovely fall day. It's very, very muggy here in Chicago. I am not used to um, humidity at all because Colorado is very dry and I like things to be dry because that is just the way that my body grew up and it's assimilated to that. But um, I'm really excited to spend some low-key time with my sister and my nephew and niece and my brother-in-law. They're amazing. Um, I'm really excited to try some, well, hopefully he has some, but um, he makes mead. I should have brought my mead, uh, sorry. Um, I was just thinking that I should have brought my sweater because um, my brother-in-law makes mead and it is so delicious and also very deadly because it is so delicious. It doesn't taste like alcohol at all. Like you just drink it and you're like, oh, this is so good. And then next thing you know, you're like full blown white girl wasted. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely gonna be drinking that to celebrate after tomorrow. Um, maybe I'll take some footage right after I walk out of the exam just to be like, I'm fucking done. Um, Cause it is the last board exam and we, in fourth year of medical school, you actually don't have any other exams, so you just have your board exams that you have to take. Um, where in third year, you have, like, the first two years of medical school, you have a significant amount of exams because, like, every two weeks, you're being tested on the material that you learned over those two weeks. Um, and that sounds like you wouldn't have learned very much, but medical school is very rigorous, and so you learn a lot in that amount of time, and so it's a lot of testing. And, like, right when you are finished with the test, you have another test in two weeks that you kind of need to start, like, learning and preparing for. Um, and then during your third year, you have tests after each clerkship. So um, I was in a special program for third year, but traditionally you have blocks of scheduled time in which you're learning OBGYN and then surgery and then family medicine and then internal medicine, pediatrics and so on. Um, and then after each of those blocks, you will have a shelf exam that you take on the material that you've learned there. Um, and... Um, for me, um, you know, so you're, again, you're continuing to have exams like every few weeks to every month or so, um, sometimes every two months, depending on how long it is. Um, but it's fairly frequent and, um, and, uh, sorry, I'm distracted because I'm, I'm pretty close to the elevator so I can hear little like bings when people come in, which hopefully won't be too late in the middle of the night, but who knows? I mean, they let me check in early, so I'm okay with it. Um, but uh, yeah, fourth year, you don't have those shelf exams because you're not really doing work in the same way. You've sort of already selected your residency, and so you're just working towards that. Um, and so we don't have any exams anymore except for these ones, which is crazy. So tomorrow is my last exam of medical school, which is nuts. 
I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really, I mean, I'm not looking forward to the exam itself, but I'm looking forward to be done. Um, crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, well, that's it. Um, Mom, if you're watching, I hope you're doing well. I miss you. I love you. Bye. All right, so now that I have had the time to insert that little video, I'll go more into my just general chit chatter of my episodes. So I'll start with what I'm wearing. This is my Professor Grubbly Planks Lesson on Unicorns Tecumseh. This is a Caitlin Hunter pattern. It was the first sweater that I ever knit, which again, it's so funny. I think when you start learning how to knit, you just start knitting uh, whatever you're really excited about. And for me, it was this sweater and I didn't really have any idea that like color work sweaters are going to be hard. And so you just jump in and you just learn how to do it and there you go. Um, this was a really great sweater. It was really easy to knit in terms of the fact that it was like very straightforward um, and the pattern itself was really, really well written. Um, I chose to do it out of definitely the wrong kind of yarn. Um, this was, like I said, it was my first sweater. So it was before I really knew anything about knitting or about yarns. And I ended up knitting it out of a alpaca yarn, which is wonderfully soft and super drapey, and I really love that. Uh, and I actually knit it out of a sport weight yarn, so I think that this pattern calls for a DK weight yarn, but I had the sport weight and wanted to knit it out of that. So I ended up just knitting a larger sweater on a smaller gauge. Um, I really, really like the fit of it. The problem with this yarn, having have it knit out of alpaca, is that it pills like crazy. So I just want to show. I mean, I have worn this sweater quite a bit, but you can just see, like, the level of pilling is a little bit absurd. This one is almost worse. It's just crazy. Um, so I definitely need to go at it with a pillar or a depiller. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but it's really comfortable, it's really warm, and it's fun because it is finally fall in Colorado. Uh, it's actually, we had just a little glimpse into winter recently. Um, so the last couple of weekends, I went up to Steamboat, uh, which is the town that I grew up in, and did some really fun mountain biking and attended a fundraiser, um, which was hilarious. So the fundraiser itself is called the Mustache Ride, and it is essentially a costume party in which you're supposed to dress up, but then also wear a fake mustache and go and ride your bike from bar to bar in Steamboat. At each bar, you get one free drink. I think there's like eight bars that are included. Um, and it's just like a cavalry riding their bikes around Steamboat. And it's really fun. It's a fundraiser for the Humane Society up in Route County. And it's just hilarious because you're, you know, progressively getting more and more tipsy as you're riding around and everyone's just screaming, it's for the animals, which was hilarious. Um, so that was really, really fun. Um, and, you know, got to raise, I think they probably raised like five grand for the Humane Society up in Steamboat, which is pretty amazing um, for such a small town. So that was really fun. And then we did some downhill mountain biking up there through the Aspens. There's a lot of Aspen trees in Colorado, especially in that part of Colorado. And so it was just every, all of the leaves were gold, like a gold to red color. And uh, it just smells, you know, that smell of decay that you get in the fall that is just gorgeous. Anyway, that was lovely. Um, the last couple of weeks have also been really, really busy because I've been just getting like a lot of interviews for residency. So I'm applying to MedPeds residency and I just have a ton of interviews to go to, which is really fun because it means that I'll have a lot of time to myself on airplanes and in hotel rooms around the continental United States over the next couple of months. So I have a lot of future knitting plans that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, and also will just give me time to finish up some uh, Christmas presents, which last year I started my Christmas presents way too late and I did not finish any of them really. I think I finished like one, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what's going on in my life right now. Um, let's get into the fun of it. So let's start talking about my finished objects over the last few weeks. 
I will start with a couple of hats that I have finished. So I have just been really excited about this Caitlin Hunter pattern. So this is the Kobo Cat by Caitlin Hunter. It's one of my favorite hats. I just knit another one um, in a sort of green color and put a nice fluffy white pom-pom on top of it. And this one I did in a cream color. Um, and I love this hat, I think, because it has the texture, but then also just this really cool mountain pattern. And as someone who grew up in the mountains and is really connected to the mountains on, you know, a really fundamental level, it's something that I just find so beautiful and so rustic in a way that I really enjoy. I also think the bobbles are a fun little texture to add to it as well. So this was yarn that I picked up while I was visiting my sister in Chicago. Uh, after I took my step two CS exam there, I spent about a week with my sister and her husband and my niece and nephew, which was fantastic. It was so fun to get to spend some quality time with them. And they are like the perfect age where they are just, their imagination is so awesome. And it's so fun to be able to explore. Even the backyard can be a complete adventure, you know? So, um, so that was really, really fun. They are two, almost three and five. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it was really, really fun. I picked up this yarn at like a really cute yarn shop, which I'm totally forgetting the name of, but I will insert. It's one of the most amazing yarn stores I've ever been to. It was a small, like super cozy yarn store that had a ton of yarn and you'll see a lot of the works in progress that I'm working on and some future works in progress were also yarn that I got there. So this is Caitlin Hunter's Kobo Cat. I am calling this my death day party hat. So this was, is a reference to, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's nearly headless Nick, but he prefers to go by Sir Nicholas de Mimsey Porpington, I believe is his full name. I'll put a little thing down in the sidebar if I'm wrong about his full name. Uh, but his death day party, which was on Halloween one year, um, and uh, Ron and Hermione and Harry get to go to the death day party, and it's just like really an interesting time. And I thought it would be perfect because the black, so this is a toft uh, baby alpaca, I think it's baby alpaca, but this is a toft alpaca pom-pom. Uh, and I think these pom-poms are really cool because it is just the softest thing ever. But what I really like about it is that the pom-pom itself um, is made from an animal that died of natural causes. And the, alfa the alpaca farmers in South America, I think it's in Peru, um, would otherwise just sort of miss out on the money that they would normally be getting from the alpaca uh, fur. Um, but then they're able to take what they would normally have lost and make it into pom-poms, but um, you're not just like killing the animals to make the pom-poms specifically. So anyway, I really like that. I thought that the black looks really, really cute with this cream color. So this cream is a, um, it is hedgehog fibers in their cereal colorway. It's their DK weight base uh, and then it's held together with a Rowan Kid Silk Haze in a sort of cream colorway. And this color is so beautiful. Um, it's cream but then it's just lightly speckled with all of these really bright colors and I think it is so cool. It really reminds me of when you're growing up as all of us 90s kids did uh, <laughs> eating Lucky Charms and you're at the end of your bowl of Lucky Charms and you just look into the bowl and the color of the milk after you've had that cereal literally looks exactly like this because it's like a cream color that then has like color leached into it from all of the marshmallows. Um, so not the most healthy breakfast, but delicious. Um, so I'll just try this on for you. Um, I really like these sort of slouchy hats. I really like this big fluffy pom-pom. I think it's something that I am going to wear so much this winter um so yeah i'm really excited about it um my next finish uh finished object is this hat which i made out of the leftovers from my soldatna crop so um this is i'm calling it my erumpent hat uh and a rumpent and an erumpent is one of the magical beasts and i'll show you something in just a second but 
Um, so this I'm calling my rumpant hat. It is knit out of Volan Vine yarns in the cor courtesan, courtesan, I'm not, <laughs> the courtesan colorway, um, Revenge of the Harpsichord, and then this is Deadly Nightshades, and then I made a pom-pom out of Deadly Nightshades to put on the top. This is the Escher hat by Ella Austin. Um, and again, it is a little bit slouchy hat. It's a little bit less slouchy than the Kobuk, um, but it is a double rim that is folded over here. And I actually tacked it down a little bit with the leftover pink color just so that I wouldn't have to like continually put it at exactly the right spot. So, um, whatever. <laughs> um, so on here, you can kind of see that I tacked it down um, in four places just with the the yarn that I had so from the inside you can just see that there's this little knot there where I sort of tied it down but um I really love this I had quite a bit of leftover of all of the colors except for Grimm from my Soldatna crop so I you know it's really fun that I got this cool hat out of it this hat was super fun it's really straightforward I think it would be a really good color work hat if you're like brand new to color work and have never done it before because you never have to catch your floats. Um, here, I know people like to see floats. So here are my floats. And you never have to catch them. So uh, it's a really good way to learn color work if you're intimidated by it. Uh, and this, I think, is, you know, more traditionally girly colors just because of the pink brim. And the hat itself is actually written that I think this pink brim is supposed to be the same contrast color as the deadly nightshades but I was just using it as a scrappy sort of make things up and this would be a really good way to use up scrappy yarn as I've already demonstrated um, and I think that it can be for like men women there's also children in the pattern as well so I think that I'm probably going to knit one of them in some bright blue colors for my nephew so yeah this hat is great it was really fun really straightforward great way to use up uh, some yarn. So the Erumpent. Um, this is a little bit of an acquisition, but my mom sent me this amazing book, uh, Newt's Commander, Fantastic Beasts, and Where to Find Them, J.K. Rowling, illustrated by Olivia ooh, Lomench Gill. I'm not sure, but this book is awesome, and it is just a book of all of the fantastic beasts that you find in the Harry Potter universe. Probably not all of them, but like the most important ones. But as I was looking through it, this is the picture for the Erumpent, and I thought that the color scheme was just really, really similar to this hat, which is why I decided to name this the Erumpent. But I will just read this paragraph. So this is the Ministry of Magic Classification XXXX, so four X's. The Erumpent is a large gray African beast of great power. Weighing up to a ton, the Erumpent may be mistaken for a rhinoceros at a distance. It has a thick hide that repels most charms and curses, a large sharp horn upon its nose, and a long rope-like tail Erumpents give birth to only one calf at a time. The erumpent will not attack unless sorely provoked, but should it charge, the results are usually catastrophic. The erumpent's horn can pierce everything from skin to metal and contains a deadly fluid, which will cause whatever is injected with it to explode. Erumpent members are not great as males. Erumpent numbers are not great as males frequently explode each other during the mating season. They are treated with great caution by African wizards. Erumpent horns, tails, and exploding fluid are all used in potions, though classified as Class B trademark tradable material, which is dangerous and subject to strict control. Um, so yeah, that is the Erumpent. In the last book, um, when they go to Luna Lovegood's house to try to talk to Xenophilius Lovegood about the Deathly Hollows, they have the horn of what they believe is a crumple horn snorkax, but is in fact an erumpin horn, and it does in fact explode um, during their visit there as they're trying to escape the Death Eaters who have come. So, um, so yeah, the erumpin. And again, that is the Escher hat by Ella Austin. I'm just drinking some straight up Lipton tea. You know, sometimes you just got to go back to the basics. Um, 
All right, and then you have already heard about this work, this as a work in progress, but now it is a finished object. So this is my soldatna crop, and I cannot say more great things about this. I think everybody and their mom and their aunt and their best friend have all knit this. <laughs> um, so I won't go into a ton of detail about the pattern itself. I think just as everyone has said, it's super fun. It's super straightforward. Um, again, this would be a great one if you want to learn how to do color work because you never have to catch your floats. It's always um, within five uh, within five stitches. So it's a really easy um, really easy knit. It's very potato chippy. The fact that throughout the yoke, the it changes all the time makes it just really, really enjoyable. I was knitting this ferociously uh, to kind of try to quench some of the anxiety that I was feeling. So um, I didn't really change. The only couple things that I changed about the pattern is I did knit it longer than it said um, and with less ease than it said. So I wanted it to be a little bit more close fitting which it definitely is. Um, it is definitely more close fitting. Um, there's no ease. There's not negative ease, but there's no ease in the garment. Um, and so I want it to be tighter and longer. So instead of repeating the through the body, I think you're only supposed to do the repeat five times. I did it eight times. And then the other thing that I did is I did the colors slightly differently. So in the pattern itself, the pink is just not used nearly as much as I think it should be. It's just strange. Um, and I wanted to incorporate it a little bit more. And so this color here is, the pattern is written, is supposed to be in the Revenge of the Harpsichord color, but I decided to do it in the pink. And then I also decided to do the cuffs um, and the waist in the pink as well to sort of bring it together a little bit. It fits really well. It's super, it's super cute. The yarn, um, I will go into, I guess, one more time. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is Wonvine Yarns in the Revenge of the Harpsichord, Grim, Cortesian, and definitely Nightshades colorways. It was her soldatna crop that she um, sold kits for to copy. I have no shame in copying her because I loved it so much. Um, <laughs> It was super cute. Um, the yarn itself is so soft. It is incredible how soft it is. I like actually can't believe it. I think that it might pill a little bit. Um, like you can already see, I have worn it a couple times, but it is starting to pill just like ever so slightly, which is fine. I mean, I just need to get one of those deep pillars. So <laughs> looks a little bit better, but, um, yeah, I'm going to wear just like the shit out of this over the winter. I just bought a pair of overalls and I'm just excited to wear all of the things with overalls. It's going to be fantastic. So yeah, those are all of my finished objects over the last month. Um, so now I'm going to move into some works in progress. Uh, okay. So Another one of the yarns that I bought while I was visiting my sister in Chicago was the Malabrigo. Oh, I have a little fixing crochet hook in there. Sorry. Uh, is the Malabrigo sock 033 in the Cereza colorway. It is this beautiful, rich red. It's a little bit, this like washes it out for sure, but I want to show it just so you can see the depth of the color. This is a little bit better representation. It's a really deep sort of more blue red, um, which I personally love. I think it looks better on me to have the cooler toned red than the more orange red. But I actually just bound off the waist of this. I still have to add in the... Uh, I still have to add in the collar uh, and the arms, but um, it's a short sleeve, so it'll be really fast. So this is my Philosopher's Stone, and it is the Rizzo by Amy Apple. I am so in love with this. I cannot even begin to describe. Um, so this is 
knit seamlessly from the top down. It has this really beautiful seed stitch texture on the top of the sweater with this really amazing eyelet detail that you can see there. So it gives this sort of covered but kind of sexy V that goes sort of down into the breast area. Uh, it is so beautiful. I'm calling it the Philosopher's Stone, obviously, because it is this beautiful, deep, rich red color. Um, and on here, I have my From New Leaf stitch markers in the Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone colorway. Um, or sorry, in the Harry Potter Sorcerer's Stone book, uh, book title, uh, book cover. And yeah, I have loved this sweater. It was a very strange construction. It was unlike anything I have ever knit before, which I found both fun and also kind of frightening because while I was knitting this, I was literally like, how the fuck is this gonna turn into a sweater? Like, I don't understand. But you know what? She wrote the pattern so perfectly that if you just follow what she says, it just works, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, you do this crazy thing where you knit the top sort of um, separately and you pick up stitches and then you end up bringing it all together at the underarm, which is also kind of nice because once you've knit a lot of it and sort of figured out the pattern, you're already halfway done with the sweater, which is really cool. She adds a lot of waist shaping. So this is a crop sweater. It's supposed to be sort of a 50s fit. So it's supposed to be kind of tight fitting and a little bit cropped. She um, has a much more womanly body than I do. So my body figure, I guess I'll stand up, is kind of like, oh, it's just like straight down. Like I don't really come in at the waist. And so it makes it so that I don't really need a ton of waist shaping because my measurement at my bust is really like only a couple inches larger than my waist measurement. So I did less of the decreasing that she did and it's on my Ravelry page exactly what I did there but other than that I followed this exactly as the pattern says and I tried it on so I bound off right now I'm in a medical Spanish elective and I was working with interpreters and I finished binding off while we were on a call and I just went into the bathroom and tried it on immediately because I was like I'm so excited and it's so cool I honestly I am one of those people who I think there are so many sweaters in the world that I don't really want to knit the same sweater more than once. But this is a sweater that I think will be so wearable and also can has the potential to be really professional that I will probably knit many, many more of these. Um, I absolutely love it. I'm really, really excited for it to be done. So, um, so yeah, my Philosopher's Stone... This is obviously a reference to the first book. Um, the British call it the Philosopher's Stone. We call it the Sorcerer's Stone, but I think the Philosopher's Stone is slightly more classy, so I like to call it that. Um, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's a really big part of the first book. It is particularly important because Professor Quirrell has, uh, who the Binge Mode podcast people refer to as Voldy Moldy on the back of his head, um, and he is trying to get access to the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone so that he can bring Voldemort back from the dead. And that would be very bad for many reasons, but he would have also had sort of an elixir of life that would keep him alive forever. Um, so it's really good that that ended up getting destroyed by Nicholas Flamel. Um, this is really fun, I think, when I think about it. The fact that the construction of this sweater was so new and so different is also a testament to the first Harry Potter book because I loved reading it so much and it taught me that I really loved reading and that was a new and fun and different experience for me. So I think this sweater, you know, really represents that book for me in more than one way. So yeah, I think I'd like to do knit this out of a like royal blue color. I think that would be beautiful. It only uses two... Um, it only uses two skeins of yarn, too. So if you just have a couple skeins of yarn that you really love that are the same, it's a really nice sweater to go for. And it's a fingering weight sweater, I guess I should say. So that is one of my works in progress. I have a couple of sock whips 
that I'm just not even going to talk about because I haven't done anything to them. I've like maybe put a couple of rows on them. I don't know why. My sock mojo is just like down in the... I'm just so excited about sweaters. I think it's like finally sweater weather that I'm like, oh my god, I want to knit all the sweaters. So super fun. Um, <coughs> I have a little bit of a cold and so talking so much is making my throat really dry and scratchy. But, you know, small price to pay to keep track of my life and have a journal for myself to reference. Um, the next wit work in progress that I have been working on is my Into the Pensive sweater. Um, this, I think, you know, I've already talked about Into the Pensive in the Pensive itself and read some excerpts from that, but I'm slowly starting to realize that the Pensive plays such a huge role in the Harry Potter series that um it's definitely something that I think when I'm finished with this sweater I'll choose some more into the pensive um excerpts that I can read but I am just chugging away on the back of this I have not really put very much work into it um I'm just starting to lose steam a little bit I think because I've knit this sweater essentially twice <laughs> so that's fair but um you can see it's coming along really nicely um this is going to be a retirement slash Christmas gift for my father-in-law, Bob Kusinen, who spent his entire career up in Steamboat um, and just retired. Um, and all of this yarn is from sheep that, um, that live in Broward County, so in the county in which he lives. So I thought that, Sean and I thought that this would be a really beautiful gift for him. Um, but it's kind of funny because I was playing cribbage with him the other weekend and he just annihilated me, which, you know, it's okay. I win too sometimes, but, um, I was knitting my, uh, Philosopher's Stone sweater, the red sweater that I just shared. And he was like, I really like that sweater color, Maggie, like hint, hint, um, which is hilarious because he is getting a sweater, but it is not bright red. So. And I should say that that is going to be a sweater vest. It's not going to be a sweater. Um, that is the Hunter sweater vest by Jared Flood. It is a Brooklyn tweed pattern, I believe. Um, and I do have some fun progress keepers on there, which I have already talked about in previous, in previous uh, podcasts. So the next whip is something that I have been ferociously knitting on over the past two days. I literally cast it on yesterday and just could not stop. I couldn't stop. Uh, it is so fun. It is the Night Shift Shawl by Andrea Mowry, and it is knit out of goosey fibers. So um, I will just go through the yarns that I'm using to knit this. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the pattern itself and the Harry Potter inspiration that I have for it. So this is the first colorway. Again, this is all Goosey Fibers. This is the, um, well, I guess I'll go through it in that order, sorry. So this is the Silly Old Bear colorway. It is this beautiful gold color and it's supposed to, all of these represent uh, Winnie the Pooh, which I think is really lovely because Winnie the Pooh was really the first book series, I mean, as a child that I fell in love with. Um, I loved Winnie the Pooh. I particularly loved Tigger. He was like my favorite for sure. Uh, but Winnie, the whole Winnie the Pooh series was just like so fun and so magical. Um, so this one is called Silly Old Bear. The quote from their website that they have with this is, some people care too much. I think it's called love, which I think is so cute. Um, so yeah, it's this beautiful gold color with some sort of red and green and dark speckling. It's really, really beautiful. And the depth of it is gorgeous. So I'm really enjoying this. I think I'm definitely going to have a lot of leftovers and I might make um, like another cowl out of it in a different color scheme so that like there's more of certain colors than are in this so that it will be using the same yarn but will look totally different. So that is Silly Old Bear. Then this is the Gloomy Place which is this beautiful sort of like periwinkle color that has more deep blues and purples and greens and grays. It's so gorgeous. Um, this is the bog where Eeyore lives, and the quote that they have with this one is, 
It's not much of a tail, but I'm sort of attached to it, which I think is just adorable because Eeyore has his tail, like, nailed to his bum. Um, uh, the next, and you know what else is really cute about this, is when I was growing up, I had a black lab named Zirkle, and we always used to call him Eeyore because he actually was clinically depressed. We had to put him on little doggy antidepressants because he was just, like, so mopey. Um, so it reminds me of Zirkle, too. May he rest in peace. Um, the next one is Smackerel of Wonder. Um, and the quote that they have with this one is, there's always time for a Smackerel of Wonder, which I think is very true and good advice. The next one is Fierce Creatures. This, I believe, it's this really nice dark brown that has some reds and some golds in it. Um, and this represents, I believe, Kinga and Rue. Um, they, what they say about it on their website, on the Goosey Fibers website, is Kinga is generally regard, regarded as one of the fiercer animals. I'm not frightened of fierce animals in the ordinary way, but it is well known that if one of the fiercer animals is deprived of its young, it becomes as fierce as two of the fiercer animals. Uh, let's see. And then the next one is the chestnuts. So this is this dark teal color but then it also has like it's a really strange color it has white and like pink and peach all in it it's really it's I have never seen a color like it before and I think it's so interesting um the chestnuts is where rabbit lives and on there it says hello rabbit he said is that you let's pretend it isn't said rabbit and see what happens um which I think is funny because I never really liked Rabbit so much because he's such a dick. Why is Rabbit such a dick? I don't understand. But anyway, it's funny. Uh, and then the last one is this like really cool sort of green, light green color that also has blues and peaches and pinks. It's also a really unique color that is so beautiful. And it has like lavender. I don't know if you can see this beautiful lavender that's coming in right here. It's just, it's gorgeous. Um, so where the woozle wasn't, would you mind coming with me, Piglet, in case they turn out to be hostile animals? <laughs> I just think it's funny. So I'm really enjoying this. Right now I'm using um, The Gloomy Place and Smackerel of Wonder in my most recent sort of iteration of this. I am calling this the Quibbler because I just love that it's sort of a chaotic hodgepodge of crazy colors. And I think, you know, that's perfect for the Quibbler. Um, and the Quibbler is the magazine that is run by Xenophilius Lovegood. When you first meet Luna Lovegood, who's one of my favorite characters, she is reading the Quibbler upside down with her Spectre Specs on. Um, and the Quibbler is also really interesting because it's kind of seen as like a really out there, really strange, really wacky, uh, and it is really wacky magazine, but then, um, during the fifth book, Rita Skeeter writes an article about Harry seeing, um, a sort of, like, all-inclusive article about when, um, Lord Voldemort comes back, and that's when people really start to actually believe Harry that Lord Voldemort is back and that all of the propaganda that's being released by the Ministry of Magic is probably not true, um, and people sort of have to come to terms with the fact that he's probably back, and even though that's scary, that they need to sort of address it and do something about it. So the Quibbler also has a very important space within the Harry Potter universe. So, um, most of this first section, the back color is the chestnut, so that sort of dark teal. There are some things that I don't love. I think that the pooling is, you can see that there's sort of pooling of white that I don't love in it. Like, like right here, right here, you can see pooling, stuff like that. But, you know, I think like this is just going to be a small portion of the shawl and when the shawl is all finished, I just, I think it's so fun. Um, so yeah, I finished like the first five sections and I'm moving on to, um, the next sort of iteration of the section. So I am really loving it. Mosaic knitting is so much fun. It's so fun to see how the colors play. I think that's why I just could not put it down yesterday. I just really wanted to see how all of the colors would knit up together. And it turns out that it's so fun. It's so fun. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about that. Just 
going to be working away on that. That's just something for me that I'm really excited about. My mom actually got me this yarn after I finished my exams. So um, that yarn is a gift from her. So it's really fun to be able to sort of start using it right away. Because I have so much time on my hands coming up over the next few months, I did want to talk a bit about some future works in progress that I want to tackle. Um, so one of them is I have had this yarn in my stash for a little while. I got it from a little yarn store up in Steamboat, which actually is closing, which I'm so sad about. Um, because it was a place where I could go and get Steamboat yarn, and now I'm not actually sure where I'll be able to access that yarn, because it was the only place that I knew of that sold all of the local yarn. I think you can go to the mill, the like WZ Fiber Mill, and pick up the yarn there, but I think they have like really spotty hours and things like that, so I'm a little bit worried, because <laughs> I really, really like this Steamboat yarn that I can get, but we will see. So, this sweater, I think I will call the Witherwing sweater. So um, I have a Buckbeak, and then this is Witherwing. So it's sort of another name that they call Buckbeak once he should have been executed, but is still alive and they know where he is um, as sort of a uh, undercover name for him or a nickname for him so that people don't know who he's talking about. But this will be the, uh, gosh, I don't know how to pronounce this, the Koivua? Koivua? I'm not sure. Um, it is the all over color work sweater. I'll try to put a picture. I'm not sure. I won't promise that because I actually uh, have no idea how to actually do that, but I'll try to figure it out. Why not? Um, so this is the Koivua pattern by Caitlin Hunter. It is an all over color work pattern. It's like three quarters sleeve. It has like a mock turtleneck um, and it has these beautiful feather, this feather motif, but it sort of goes in between the feather and all over color work and like a nice textured pattern. It is so cool. I think I want to do it sort of bigger and boxier because I want it to be something that I can wear with like high-waisted skinny jeans and things like that and have it look really good. So um, I'm really excited about that. I'm planning on knitting it out of this Blue Sky Fibers wool stock worsted. So this is just their sort of natural cream colorway and it's a worsted weight it's super squishy and like very next to skin soft um so i'm going to be knitting it out of that and then the contrast color the color work i'm going to be holding these two yarns together um so this is a uh, shibui silk cloud in the brownstone colorway that is looks more orange than it actually is it's kind of like a burnt orange mixed with brown color and then I'm going to be holding that together with this marled hand spun yarn that is from Steamboat. Um, so this is 80% alpaca, 20% merino and this was hand spun and the animals are also from Rapp County. Um, so I think this will just be really beautiful. It will be mostly this brown and gray marled color and then I think this is more of a DK and it's a worsted weight sweater, so I'll hold it together with this. And um, I think this will give it like a nice extra little marl, but then also the color work will have that mohair like fluff, which I'm really excited about. So that is coming up shortly. It'll just depend when I'm finished, if I'm feeling like color work, if I'm feeling like something a little bit easier for plain knitting. So that's one. And then the other one that I'm really excited about is um, doing is knitting the um, Arbusto by Rosa Pomar. And again, I'll put a picture if I can figure out how to do that, which I, no promises, no promises. Um, but this is an all over, I think it's top down reverse stockinette uh, pattern that has bobbles all over it. Um, and it's knit in a like light worsted, DK weight and this is a DK weight yarn by um, Acadia um, or sorry by the Fiber Co. This is the Acadia by the Fiber Co. It's a rustic blend of silk noil, baby alpaca and merino. So it's 60% wool, 20% alpaca and 20% silk. Um, it has a beautiful shine to it. It also has these little flecks of I think this is the silk. Um, that's sort of lightly dyed. The fact that it has the alpaca, I think it gives it a 
sort of darker, more rich, deep color. It is in the yellow birch colorway. It is sort of a chartreuse green. I love this yarn so much. I picked I picked this yarn up in a variety of different places. I got some of it in San Francisco, some of it in two different shops here in Denver. Um, I know that I probably should care more about dye lot because there were def will definitely be like slight differences, but it's a um, it's a uh, yarn that's not hand dyed. It's like a machine dyed. Um, on a larger scale, so I'm not as worried about the, the color, but I'm really excited about this. I think it's such a beautiful color. I, if you haven't noticed, really, really like dual tones, and I think this will be a really beautiful addition to my wardrobe. It is so soft as well, so I'm really excited about both of those. Um, and then, the last thing is, um, so... The last bit of yarn that I picked up while I was visiting my sister in Chicago was this. Um, and this is a Norwegian yarn that Ellie from Skein Your Knits talks about all of the time. And when I found out that they carry this Norwegian yarn at this little yarn store, I like almost shat myself. I was like, ah! Um, so this is Rauma Fino Garn. It is um, their fingering weight yarn, and I'm going to be knitting the underwing mitts. That is a pattern by Erica Huser, um, and it was like really popular, I think, a couple of years ago before I started knitting, but I think it is so cool. It's the one that on the back side has that sort of moth motif on it. Um, so these are really beautiful. This one is like a natural heather colorway. Sorry, that's upside down. So beautiful. And then this one is sort of a dark, dark gray, almost black color. Um, it's really getting washed out by this. Maybe if I move that. Um, so pretty. Um, so I'm going to hold those. I'm going to do the color work out of that. And I think because it is a more rustic yarn, the color work will just be much easier to do. And then you need a little bit of contrast to do the last little bit. And I'm going to be using this Hedgehog Fiber mini skein, which is called Park Life. And it is so cool. And so I think that that will look really cool together. I'm really excited. Um, and it will just be a tiny little bit of this, but I think it'll be a fun little pop of color. Um, so yeah, those are the three big things that are not gift knits that I can actually talk on here that I'm going to be working on uh, for future works in progress. I do have, I know that I've talked about some stuff that I bought while I was at that yarn store in a suburb of Chicago, but I thought that I would also talk about a couple of other really amazing gifts that my mom got me before I move into Harry Potter talk. So, up until now, I have been spinning, I have just been putting the yarn on the back of a chair that I have when it is in a skein and roll it, hand rolling it into balls of yarn, um, which is so tedious and I kept telling myself like I like doing it myself because I can kind of like see the color play and I think that's true but not when you're winding up like a huge ball of yarn or even like a fingering weight where it's just like 400 meters of a tiny little yarn so anyway I had which I won't go into here but I had sort of a, an unfortunate interaction with a family member of mine um, and I was really, really sad about it, and my mom wanted to do something nice for me to make me feel better. And so she got me a ball winder and a Swift, which was such a special surprise. It was something that she, like, didn't really tell me that was going to happen, and then I just, like, came home one day, and it was in the mail, and it was really, really special. So thank you, Mom. It meant a lot. But um, after I got it, I just wound, like, so many balls of yarn like I was just like I'm gonna do it all uh, just because I was having fun playing with it but this is a tabletop ball winder it is the maple jumbo maple jumbo ball winder from the fiber artist supply co and it is so incredible it works so smoothly it sits right on your tabletop so it's really easy to like take up and put down 
and you literally just spin this and it winds the yarn onto a ball. It's so cool. It works so smoothly. Everything about it is literally perfect. Um, I love it so much. I've used it a bunch of times. The fact that it's all wood and it's made in the United States is also really nice because if anything happens to it, you can really easily get um, replacement parts for it. Um, but so far, it's just, oh, it does everything so fast. And my husband was so excited about it that he was like, can I do it? Can I roll one? Um, and I had to be like, you can roll one, but I'm having fun rolling them. So please don't roll all of them. Um, and then the other thing that I got to go with it is the Swift that they had with that they have, which again is just the large hard maple Swift. Um, it's also a tabletop Swift, which I really like because it's really easy to just like set on the dining room table and roll a yarn. It is like it works really really well. Um, it's also by the um, Viber Artist Supply Co. Um, and what I really like about it too is that you can just move these pegs around and make it bigger or smaller um, depending on how big your skein of yarn is um, so yeah this it works amazingly I really really love it and it was a very very fun surprise gift so um, all right that is the end of the crafty talk I am now going to be moving on to talking more about Azkaban. So um, this was my Bars of Azkaban Fortress Soldatna crop. I decided to name it that because I feel like this really looks like rusted metal, like rusted iron. And I imagine that the Bars of Azkaban have a lot of rust on them because it is in the middle of the ocean. So I did a little bit of research about Azkaban Fortress and it turns out like I always thought Azkaban was a terrible place but after learning more about it it's like truly a horrific place um and my little social, ju social justice warrior who like cares a lot about people and cares a lot about people who are in the just criminal justice system while I was reading it I was like this is so fucked up like it's it's way more fucked up than even like solitary confinement which is literally the most like I the fact that we do that to people is um insane in a way that is a human rights violation in my opinion and I think in most people who work in any form of healthcare's opinion because of the huge damage that it does to people um mentally and physically. So, um, yeah, you know, um, I think that cruel and unusual treatment was put into our constitution for a reason. And I think it would be really smart if we actually abided by that, especially for all of the conservative people out there who really want to abide by the constitution for what it is actually written out to say. Anyway, I'll get off of my soapbox now, but so let's just learn a little bit about all of the human rights atrocities and violations that happen in the, in the uh, Azkaban Fortress, shall we? So the Azkaban Fortress. So the name Azkaban derives... Oh, and I should say that all of this is um, from the, the Pottermore website um, that I'm about to read, and then I will read a couple of excerpts from books as well. So Azkaban. The name Azkaban derives from a mixture of the prison Alcatraz, which is its closest muggle equivalent, being set on an island, and Abaddon, which is a Hebrew word meaning place of destruction or depths of hell. It's a lovely place, right? Especially the fact that you also know that at least two innocent people have spent a considerable amount of time there, one being Sirius Black and another being Hagrid. So... The fact that you send innocent people here is insane, but I would also like to say that even people like Beatrix Lestrange should not have to spend the rest of their days here. I'm just saying. Okay, so Azkaban has existed since the 15th century. It was originally not a prison. Originally, it was the home to a sorcerer who was insane and practiced the worst kinds of dark arts on muggle sailors who he had lured to his castle. Um, 
When he died, the concealment charm that he had put on the fortress broke, and the Minister of Ministry of Magic became aware of the Azkaban fortress. Those who entered to investigate, so they sent orders to investigate um, Azkaban and this like horrific place. Um, they refused to talk about what they found inside, but the least frightening part of it was that it was completely infested with Dementors. So, from the Pottermore website, it says, The very walls of the building seemed steeped in misery and pain, and the Dementors were determined to cling to it. Experts who had studied buildings built with and around dark magic contended that Azkaban might wreak its own revenge upon anybody attempting to destroy it. The fortress was therefore left abandoned for many years, a home to continually breeding Dementors. Once the international statute of secrecy had been imposed, the Ministry of Magic felt that the small wizarding prisons that extended up and down the country in various towns and villages posed a security risk, because attempts by incarcerated witches and wizards to break out often led to undesirable bangs, smells, and light shows. A purpose-building, a purpose-built prison located on some remote island was preferred, and plans had been drawn up when um, Democles Rowell became Minister of Magic. In spite of opposition from many wizards, among them experts on both Dementors and buildings with Azkaban's kind of dark history, Rowell carried out his plan, and soon a steady trickle of prisoners had been placed in Azkaban. Uh, none ever emerged. So they were put in there, and they never came out. If they were not mad and dangerous before being placed in Azkaban, they swiftly became so. So, um, let's just learn a little bit more about this Minister of Magic. So, Democles Rowell, he was an authoritarian who had risen to power on an anti muggle agenda, capitalizing on the anger felt by much of the wizarding community at being forced to go underground. You know, it's funny because I don't always want to put my political views on this, but it's my own journal, so I feel like I can. Um, this person sounds a lot like Donald Trump, um, and the fact that he rose to power um, on an anti-democrat and anti-democracy and anti-basic um, human rights agenda, capitalizing on the anger felt by a lot of racist white Americans. Um, so... It's my two cents, like it or not. It's the way it is. Um, so, back to Azkaban. Um, prisoners were mostly insane, and a graveyard had been established on the grounds to accommodate those who died of despair. <sighs> From the time until the advent of Kingsley Shacklebolt, no minister ever seriously considered closing Azkaban. They turned a blind eye to the inhumane conditions inside the fortress, permitted it to be magically enlarged and expanded, and rarely visited due to the awful effects of entering a building populated by thousands of dementors. Most justified the attitude by pointing to the prison's perfect record at keeping prisoners locked up. Because they were completely insane and living in the deepest depths of despair that they couldn't get out. Anyway, um, under Kingsley Shacklebolt, literally one of the best characters ever. I need to knit something about Kingsley Shacklebolt because he is such a badass. Um, under Kingsley Shacklebolt, Azkaban was purged of Dementors. While it remains in use as a prison, the guards are now Aurors who are regularly rotated from the mainland. There has been no breakout since this new system was introduced. So, Azkaban, the place of thousands of human rights violations. Um... But I also thought it would be interesting to read a couple of about a couple of escapes. Um, so there are three main escapes that are talked about in the um, in the Harry Harry Potter series. So the first one occurs when Sirius Black escapes from Azkaban. I'm going to read that. That is located in um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. I'm also going to read about Barty Crouch Jr., who, with the help of his father and his mother, also escapes from Azkaban. That is in um, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And then also in the fifth book, there is a mass breakout from Azkaban after the Dementors have already um, have already gone toward the dark arts and have sort of gone on the side of Lord Voldemort. So that's when a huge number of Death Eaters escape out of Azkaban Fortress. But... I am going to begin 
with reading a small excerpt from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. This is towards the end of the book. Um, it is in chapter 19, The Servant of Lord Voldemort. And this is just for a little bit of context. Right now, the trio is in the shrieking, uh, in the shrieking shack with, um, with Teddy Lupin and Sirius Black. And they are learning about how Sirius escaped from Azkaban. <clears throat> er, Mr. Black, Sirius, said Hermione. Black jumped at being addressed like this and stared at Hermione as though being spoken to politely was something he'd long forgotten. If you don't mind me asking, how, how did you get out of Azkaban if you didn't use dark magic? Thank you, gasped Pettigrew. <laughs> Sorry, I opened a little, a little bit of ginger kombucha. Thank you, gasped Pettigrew, nodding frantically at her. Exactly, precisely, what I... But Lupin silenced him with a look. Black was frowning slightly at Hermione, but not as much as though he were annoyed with her. He seemed to be pondering his answer. I don't know how I did it, he said slowly. I think the only reason I never lost my mind is that I knew I was innocent. That wasn't a happy thought, so the Dementors couldn't suck it out of me. But it kept me sane, and knowing who I am helped me keep my powers... So when it all became too much, I could transform in my cell, become a dog. Dementors can't see, you know, he swallowed. They feel their way toward people by sensing their emotions. They could tell that my feelings were less, less human, less complex when I was a dog. But they thought, of course, that I was losing my mind like everyone else in there. So it didn't trouble them, but, it, but I was weak, very weak, and I had no hope of driving them away from me without a wand. But then I saw Peter in that picture. I realized he was at Hogwarts with Harry, perfectly positioned to act if one hint reached his ears that the dark side was gathering strength again. Pettigrew was shaking his head, mouthing no noiselessly, but staring all the while at Black as though hypnotized. Ready to strike at the moment he could be sure of allies, and to deliver the last Potter to them. If he gave them Harry, who dare say he'd betrayed Lord Voldemort? He'd be welcomed back with honors. So you see, I had to do something. I was the only one who knew Peter was still alive. Harry remembered what Mr. Weasley had told Mrs. Weasley. The guards say he's been talking in his sleep, always the same words. He's at Hogwarts. It was as if someone had lit a fire in my head, and the Dementors couldn't destroy it. It wasn't a happy feeling. It was an obsession. But it gave me strength. It cleared my mind. So one night, when they opened my door to bring food. I slipped past them as a dog. It's so much harder for them to sense animal emotions that they were confused. I was thin, very thin, thin enough to slip through the bars. I swam as a dog back to the mainland. I journeyed north and slipped into the Hogwarts grounds as a dog. I've been living in the forest ever since, except when I came to watch the Quidditch, of course. You fly as well as your father did, Harry. Believe me, croaked Black. Oh. He looked at Harry, who did not look away. Believe me, croaked Black. Believe me, Harry. I never betrayed James and Lily. I would have died before I betrayed them. And at long last, Harry believed him. Throw too tight to speak, he nodded. <sighs> I just got goosebumps. <laughs> um... I think that excerpt is so beautiful because... It really shows how much Sirius loved them and how much guilt he showed for when he said, I did it. It was my fault because he was the one who convinced James and Lily to use Peter as their secret keeper. And so in a way, even though it wasn't his fault, in a way it was that they died. And he just felt so much guilt about that. And it was not a happy feeling. And I just think that's so beautiful. And also, it's so tragic because... You know, through this whole book, at the very end, Sirius is like, you know, well, actually, it's not at the very end. It's sort of in the middle <laughs> before um, Snape kind of comes back and brings him to the castle. But he has this moment with Harry where he's like, you know, you could live with me. You could have a different life. And Harry takes the moment to really take that in and realize that things could have been different for him. And it's so sad that Sirius dies because Harry never gets to 
never gets to experience what that life could be like. So, <coughs> serious back. R.I.P. buddy. Okay. The next one is The Escape of Body Crouch, Barty Crouch Jr. This is in Harry Potter and the um, Goblet of Fire. It is also towards the very end of the book. So this is in chapter 35, Veritaserum. <clears throat> Harry saw a man lying before him. Oh, and I guess I should say um, just a little bit of context. So um, this is the part after Cedric Diggory has been killed, after Lord Voldemort has come back. Um, they are in the... Uh, Harry is in the office with what he thought was Moody, um, but turns out to be Barty Crouch. Um, and they find the real Moody um, in the chest of drawers. Or so, sorry, sort of the big wizarding chest that he's been kept captive in for the entire year. Um, and this is about them figuring out, you know, what happened and what's going on and um, sort of putting all the pieces of this together. So... Harry saw a man lying before him, pale, pale skin, slightly freckled, with a mop of fair hair. He knew who he was. He had seen in Dumbledore's pensive and watched him being led away from court by Dementors, trying to convince Mr. Crouch that he was innocent. But he was lined around the eyes now and looked much older. There were hurried footsteps outside in the corridor. Snape had returned with Wink Winky at his heels. Professor McGonagall was right behind them. Crouch! Snape said, stopping dead in the doorway. Barty Crouch? Good heavens, said Professor McGonagall, stopping dead and staring down at the man on the floor. Filthy, disheveled. Winky peered around Snape, Snape's legs. Her mouth opened wide, and she let out a piercing shriek. Master Barty! Master Barty! What is you doing here? She flung herself forward into the young man's chest. You has killed him! You has killed him! You has killed Master's son! He is simply stunned, Winky, said Dumbledore. Step aside, please. Severus, you have the potion. Snape handed Dumbledore a small glass bottle of completely clear liquid, the Veritaserum, with which he had threatened Harry in class. Dumbledore got up, bent over the man on the floor, and pulled him into a sitting position against the wall beneath the faux glass, in which the reflections of Dumbledore, Snape, and McGonagall were still glaring down upon them all. Winky remained on her knees, trembling, her hands over her face. Dumbledore forced the man's mouth open and poured three drops inside. Then he pointed his wand at the man's chest and said, Renovate. Crouch's son opened his eyes. His face was slack, his gaze unfocused. Dumbledore knelt before him so that his face, so that their faces were level. Can you hear me? Dumbledore asked quietly. The man's eyelid flickered. Yes, he muttered. I would like you to tell us, said Dumbledore softly. How you came to be here? How did you escape from Azkaban? Crouch took a deep breath, shuddering breath, then began to speak in a flat, expressionless voice. My mother saved me. She knew she was dying. She persuaded my father to rescue me as, her, as a last favor to her. He loved her as he had never loved me. He agreed. They came to visit me. They came to a drop of... They gave me a draft of polyjuice potion containing one of my mother's hairs. She took a draft of polyjuice potion containing one of my hairs. We took on each other's appearance. Winky was shaking, her head trembling. Say no more, Master Barty, say no more. You was getting your father into trouble. But Crouch took another deep breath and continued in the same flat voice. The Dementors are blind. They sensed only healthy, one healthy, one dying person entering Azkaban. They sensed one healthy, one dying person leaving it. My father smuggled me out disguised as my mother in case any prisoners were watching through their doors. My mother died a short while afterward in Azkaban. She was careful to drink Polyjuice Potion until the end. She was buried under my name and bearing my appearance. Everyone believed her to be me. The man's eyelids flickered. And with that, did your father do... And what did your father do with you when he got you home, said Dumbledore quietly. Say to my mother's death, a quiet private funeral. The, ga the grave is empty. The house elf nursed me back to health. Then I had to be concealed. I had to be controlled. My father had to use a number of spells to, to subdue me. When I had recovered my strength, I thought only of finding my master, of returning to his service. How did your father subdue you? said Dumbledore. The imperious curse, Crouch said. I was under my father's control. I was forced to wear an invisibility cloak day and night. 
I was always with the house elf. She was my keeper and caretaker. She pitied me. She persuaded my father to give me occasional treats, rewards for my good behavior. Master Barty, Master Barty, sobbed Winky through her hands. You isn't ought to tell them. We is getting in trouble. <sighs> so, another escape. Um, and one that was very detrimental to the wizarding world. <sighs> so, that is all the Harry Potter talk that I have for today. Um, Azkaban Fortress, what a nightmare of a place. Um, so, yeah, I hope that everyone is enjoying the fall weather, having fun in Rhinebeck in a couple of weeks. I definitely will not be going. I'll be traveling all over the country, like I said. Um, I have 10 interviews scheduled right now. Um, I'll try to go through them. So I have an interview right now at... Um, University of San Diego, um, Minnesota, Maine, Colorado, Utah, Rochester, Johns Hopkins, Duke, Chicago, and one more that I am forgetting right now. Um, but I'm really excited. I'm really excited to just travel around the U.S. and learn more about the schools and um, and about, you know, their programs and what kind of things they have to offer. Um, and, you know, just see, see where I fit best and see what I'm most excited about. Um, so yeah, I'll have a lot of knitting time and I'll keep trying to check in as much as I can. Um, it'll probably be pretty spotty just because I will be so busy, but, um, happy knitting and until we meet again. All right.